So this is going to be one of those classes where there's more than one link. Because instead of pausing the video, I stopped it. But anyway, let's go back to the novel. Um, end of the first paragraph in this chapter. On the contrary, uh, she was sorry but could not repent. On the contrary, her plans and proceedings were more and more justified, endeared to her by the general appearance of the next few days. I, I hope you were noticing, um, probably with some chuckles, that Emma profoundly misre misreads the clues. Um, second paragraph, Emma was soon perfectly satisfied of Mr. Martin's being no otherwise remembered than he um, furnished a contrast with Mr. Elton of the utmost advantage to the latter. So we know Emma is inflating Mr. Elton, and but as that article said, we can determine from the quality of Mr. Martin's writing that he was in fact a better match for Harriet than Elton. Next paragraph. Her views of, of improving her little friend's mind by a great deal of useful reading and conversation had never yet led to more than a few first chapters and the intention of, of going on tomorrow. A few lines later. Um, the evening of life. Uh, I don't need to read that. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Um, the only mental provision she was making for the evening of life was the collecting and transcribing of all the riddles of every sort that she could meet with uh, into a thin quarto uh, of hot pressed paper made up by her and her friend ornamented with ciphers and trophies. Um, so they're collecting riddles. Uh, it just seems like a pointless thing to do, but um, which it is because, as we read in that article, that the, the quality of writing is important. If we go on to page 68, um, first paragraph, Mr. Woodhouse was almost as much interested in the business as the girls, suggesting the shallowness of Mr. Woodhouse. Um, they're, they're, they're taking on something, collecting riddles, connect, collecting other people's riddles. Uh, and then this whole chapter is interested in the riddle or it, it, at the end of the first paragraph. And it always ended in Kitty, a fair but frozen mind. So the whole chapter is about this poem. If you go down a few lines later, um, it says, my, it indented, my, my first doth affliction denote, which my second is destined to feel, and my whole is the best antidote, that affliction to soften and heal. Um, the first is woe, and the second is man, and the whole is therefore woman. These charades were riddles, and from them you were to derive a one word clue. So in this case, the clue is woman. The poem is a typical example of the gallant compliment to woman found in much literature of the time, and this would give Mr. Elton particular reason to select it. So there's the, the, the a kind of um, chivalric treatment of women, women at the time. One didn't ever um, disagree with a woman. Mr. Knightley does, though. And it, it is an interesting contrast between Mr. Elton and Mr. Knightley, who um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Elton, uh, again, is uh, full of drivel and not really very, he's very complimentary, not very honest, I suppose I would say. Uh, and if we go on to the next page, there's the charade that the author, the, the, the critic was talking about, the charade that was written by, um, is this the one that was written by him? Yeah. But Harriet was in a tremor and could not touch it. And Emma, never loath to be first, was obliged to examine it herself. To Miss 
blank. And then we have this charade. I'm on page 70. She cast her eye over it, pondered, caught the meeting, read it through again to be quite certain and quite mistress of the line, and then passing it to Hera, Harriet, sat happily smiling and saying to herself while well, Harriet was puzzling over the paper in all the confusion of, of hope and dullness. So Harriet doesn't get it. And of course, Emma does. And uh, while Emma fails to conceive that he could be looking at her because she is the object of his interest, he may intend his look to impart additional meaning to his words. So Emma just isn't getting that Mr. Elton has his eye on Emma, not in the slightest bit interested in Harriet. Um, and we're going to see part of the problem for Mr. Elton with Harriet is that Harriet was born of nobody, illegitimate. And Mr. Elton is definitely a social climber. He wants Emma's fortune. So we go on and we look at page, um, page 70, um, uh, her hope and dullness. She's stupid, so to speak. At the end of that paragraph, this is saying very plainly, pray, Miss Smith, give me leave to pay my addresses to you. Approve my charade and my intentions in the same glance. So Emma is misreading this. And a few lines later, Harriet, read, let's see, wait, all the better. A man must very much be in love indeed to describe her so. Um, this is her interior. Uh, ah, Mr. Knightley, this is Emma's interior thoughts. Um, I wish you had the benefit of this. I think this would convince you for once in your life, you would be obliged to own yourself mistaken. Well, of course, we know that ironically, Mr. Knightley is not mistaken. Emma is. Down at the bottom of page 70, and it goes back up onto 71, um, uh, he calls her, let's see, or a trident or a mermaid or a shark. Behold him there, the monarch of the seas. And so those those creatures are um, the kind of creatures that live in, that, that are the king of the sea. And a man would actually have to be a complete fool to describe Harriet this way, says my book. This is a note in my book. Um, and Mr. Elton, for all his limitations, is not that. Even a blindly infatuated lover would presumably find some other quality than ready wit to praise in Harriet. That's the, she just doesn't. Again, with that article, Harriet never says much of anything. She can't even think for herself when she has to decline, um, has to decline, according to Emma, the um, Mr. Martin. Let's see. Uh, let's see. The study of classical antiquity, which is why these references to the kings of the seas, um, especially classical languages, was central to the education given to boys. Girls, in contrast, and this is an interesting note about the education of women at the period, um, girls would, in contrast, not learn Latin or Greek, but they still could acquire a general familiarity with many aspects of the ancient world, whether from their education or from books of the time, which often contained classical references. Um, so this would have been something that Emma, of course, would recognize, but certainly not Harriet who is not that sharp. Um, and then we go on a little bit more with, um, with the uh, charade. But, ah, uh, united courtship, you know, what reverse we have. Oh, I, I've gone on to page 71. Man's boasted power and freedom, all are flown. L Lord of the earth and sea, he bends a slave, and woman, lovely woman, resigns along, or reigns along. The idea of a man as a woman's slave due to the seductive power of her charms appears frequently in the literature of the time and would be especially likely to be employed by a man wishing to convince a woman of his devotion and win her hand. So 
Emma takes the this this poem, so to speak, this riddle, and transforms it in her imagination to be representative of uh, Mr. Alton's devotion to Harriet. That is not the case. If we look at the top of page 72, this is so pointed and so particular a meaning in this compliment, said she, that I cannot have a moment's doubt as to Mr. Alton's intentions. You are his object. That's in her imagination. Uh, and go back to the contrast between Mr. Knightley, who is straightforward, and Emma, who's just creating a fiction. Um, let's see. I thought I could not be so deceived, but now it is clear. The state of his mind is as clear and decided as my wishes on the subject have ever be have been ever since I knew you. So <laughs> she's creating... Um, she's creating this fiction and she's persuading Harriet that it's true. That's the meanness of it. Uh, yes, Harriet, just so long, just so long have I been wanting the very circumstance to happen, which has happened. Um, but that's not true. If we look on page, uh, 72, the, I congratulate you, uh, my dear Harriet with all my heart. This is an attachment which a woman may well feel pride in creating. She's sometimes Emma really makes me mad. I'm just saying. Um, this is a connection which offers nothing but good. It will give you everything you want, consideration, independence, and a proper home. This, Harriet, is an alliance or a marriage which can never raise a blush in either of us. So... In the back of your head, don't forget that poor Harriet came from nobody, and that's a blight on her. Um, she could easily become the dreaded spinster because that's something that she cannot shed. Uh, at the top of page 73, when Miss Smith's and Mr. Elton's get acquainted, they do indeed, and really it is strange. It is out of the common course that what is so evidently, evidently so palpably desirable, what counts the prearrangement of other people, should so immediately shape itself into the proper form. So Emma is just making this up. Um, by now, I was really annoyed with this young woman. Um, my book tells me these, along with one's own home, with, oh, when I go back to consideration, independence, and a proper home, um, these, along with one's own home, were the principal practical benefits of a marriage for a, a woman, and they were substantial benefits in most cases. They would be especially significant for Harriet due to the social taint of her illegitimacy. But her lack of family or a home other than Mrs. Goddard's, that's the school, and her apparent lack of any fortune besides the allowance maintaining her at presence. Um, Miss uh, Perry probably has heard only positive uh, opinions of Mr. Elton. For those living in Highbury, including those at Mrs. Goddard's, show themselves to be great admir admirers of him, of his throughout the novel. Uh, the people at Mrs. Goddard's, though, are placed there. And remember that um, teachers weren't necessarily high on the social ranks. I take that to ask. So we go into the next page. What page am I on? Page 73. Um, uh, let's see. Almost down at the bottom of page 73. If they wish to have you settled in some country or circle which they have chosen to place you in, here it will be accomplished. And if their only object is that you should, in the commonest phrase, be well married, here is the comfortable fortune, the respectable establishment, the rise in the world which must satisfy them. So what she sees is that, in fact, an, um, uh, an, um, attachment to Mr. Elton would be advantageous to Harriet. But what Emma has failed to notice is that Mr. Elton isn't 
willing to attach himself to somebody with that kind of a social team, with no fortune and no no homestead. Down at the bottom, or this is the top of 74. Yes, very true. How nicely you talk. I love to hear you. You understand everything. You and Mr. Elton are one as clever as the other. This charade, if I had studied a 12th month, I could never have made anything like it. Um, Harriet's complete inability in, in this regard, which her earlier efforts uh, uh, attested to, makes it ironic that she under Emma, Emma's inspiration, should have undertaken the compiling of a book of charades and riddles. So the point is that um, there's irony in the fact that they are compiling other people's charades and riddles, that Harriet doesn't understand them. And yet, and neither does Mr. Woodhouse, remember. So they two, those two are, are not clever. They are not clever, and Emma is. If we look at page 74. So here's where Emma says that she doesn't consider the length of the charade to be to its advantage, emphasizing again that the, the shortness and brevity is the, um, is the style of the time. Um, Next uh, um, couple paragraphs down. It is one thing, said she presently, her cheeks in a glow, to have very good sense in a common way like everybody else. And if there is anything to say, to sit down and write a letter, say just what you must in a short way. And another to write verses and charades like that. We're, we're contrasting Mr. Martin's writing and Mr. Elton's writing. There's this whole underlying... Um, discovery by Austin in the quality of writing. Um, let's see. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, what a pity that I must not write this beautiful charade into my book. I'm sure I have not got one half of so good. I don't know why I, he said it was only... Oh, yeah, because um, Elton had said, don't take this. And put it in the book. Um, and Emma disregards that. He wanted it to be for private enjoyment. But Emma removes the last two lines. Take it away. And all appropriation ceases. And a very pretty gallant charade remains. Fit for any collection. So she takes out what appears to be... Um, a statement of devotion to the reader. Elton, of course, means it for Emma, and Emma means it for Harriet. We go over to page 75. <clears throat> I shall never let that book go out of my hands. Um, very well said, Emma. A most natural. Oh, yeah, I know why. So, um, Harriet is so taken with this charade that Elton has written for Emma that she says she'll never, uh, Harriet says she'll never let it go. And it sort of reminded me of when people shake hands with someone, someone great, and they say, oh, I'll never wash this hand again. And that's kind of the tone that I got there. Um, She's just so smitten. And then uh, down in the next paragraph, uh, do not be overpowered by such a little tribute of admiration. If he had been anxious for secrecy, he would not have left the paper while I was by, but he ra rather would have pushed it towards me than towards you. Emma is just misreading all of the cues. Um, Emma's attitude contrasts with both Harriet's and Mr. Elton's, for they treat all of this as a serious business while she treats it like a game. And from the start, when she's trying to push these two together, to her, it's a game. She's trying to see if she can um, succeed. She wants to win with another matchmaker, um, matchmaking. Um, 
In this respect, her choice of riddles and charades as means to advance the love of the other two is appropriate. So it, that, in other words, it is um, well within what she's trying to do. If we go down to page, um, oh, what am I looking at? Page 76. Um, again with the a kitty kitty a fair but frozen maid kindled a flame i yet deplore the hoodwinked boy i call to aid though his near approach afraid so fatal to my suit before um the the lines as in emma indicates are um from David Garrick, a poet from the 1700s, the late 1717 to 1779, the leader, leading actor of the 18th century England, and also the author of plays and poems. The piece was first published in 1757 as written by a lady. Um, remember, that's how uh, um, Austin published her books as well, whose maid had set her chimney on fire. The rest of one version, it went through several slight modifications over the years. And the answer, this is another charade, another word puzzle. Um, and th that charade, um, the riddle, the, the, saw, the, the answer to the riddle is a chimney sweep. And if we look down at the bottom, yes, Papa, it is written out in our second page. We copied it from the elegant extracts. It's Garrick's, you know. Uh, I, very true, I wish I could recollect, recollect more of it. Kitty, a fair but frozen maid. So the conversation is revealing because um, Mr. Woodhouse can't recollect the piece. It's a charade about a, tr a chimney sweep. It's a, uh, if we look up right under that line, the name makes me think of poor Isabella. He always refers to her as that. For she was very near being christened Catherine from her grandmother. I hope we shall have her here next week. Have you thought, my dear, where you shall put her and what room there will be for the children? The issue is there, um, if we see, Emma acting as the mistress of the house, but the, it's also interesting that Mr. Woodhouse, remember, always um, looks at marriage as a change, which he doesn't like, and so he refers to her all the time as poor Isabella. And so she just says, um, she already knows where she's going to put them um, on the, this is page 77. Yes. The, Isabella and her husband live in London, which is where they have to live. They don't have to live there, but they do because um, her husband, Mr. John Knightley, the brother of our Mr. Knightley, is an attorney. And he lives in London because that's where most of them would have lived at the time. Um, so his name is Mr. John Knightley, to, to separate him from Mr. Knightley. Um, middle of page 77, it would be very hard indeed, my dear, if poor Isabella were to be anywhere but at Hartfield. Mr. Woodhouse just really wants her to stay with her kids at his house. But, and we'll see this in a bit, Isabella is quite devoted to her husband um, and not a great thinker either. Uh, in this conversation, as throughout the book, Emma shows great care and attention to her father, as well as a great capacity to understand his foibles and eccentricities, and to speak to him in a manner that allays his anxiety. We'll see that repeatedly. Um, Mr. Woodhouse needs to be cared for by, by Emma, and she takes good care of him. It, it does suggest a multifaceted character. We've seen her really not treating Harriet the way, in a in appropriate way, but we, another element of her is the care with which she treats her father. 
Um, then let's see, down at the bottom of page 79, I have a note to myself here and I can't find it. Later in the morning, and just as the girls were going to, this is page 79, going to separate in preparation for the regular four o'clock dinner, um, we've seen characters in other novels, not just Austin's, who prepare for dinner by putting on more formal clothing. Most people ate dinner at this time, or only a little later. It's about 4 o'clock. Originally, dinner was the midday meal, and supper the evening meal. These are just fun facts to know and tell. But during the 18th century, the wealthy began to keep later hours, partly under the influence of better lighting technology, and therefore began to eat dinner later. This, in turn, made a later dinner hour a source of social distinction, which further encouraged the process. But we are given to see that Mr. Woodhouse is pretty old fashioned and he still um, eats at an earlier hour. It's just a, a reflection on the social decorum and also on Mr. Woodhouse, old, Woodhouse's old fashionedness. Um, let's see. We go over to 144. There is a reference to a rubber. That's a card game. And then a few pages, a few lines down, just before it goes over to 79. You must make my apologies to your friend, but so good a charade must not be confined to one or two. He may be sure of every woman's approbation while he writes with such gallantry. And Mr. Elton says, I have no hesitation in saying, replied Mr. Elton, though hesitating a good deal while he spoke. I have no hesitation. I, I know I, why I underlined this. Look at the way Mr. Elton talks here. Um, I have no hesitation in saying, at least if my friend feels at all as I do, I have not the smallest doubts that. Could he see his little effusion honored as I see it, looking at the book again and replacing it on the table, he would consider it as the proudest moment of his life. Um, Mr. Elton speaks in fits and starts, phrases held together with hyphens and um, and in this whole paragraph, he barely says anything, even though it's a lot of words. Um, after this speech, he was gone as soon as possible. Emma could not think it too soon, for with all his good and agreeable qualities, there was a sort of parade in his speeches. So it's interesting. Um, she knows the way he talks, that it's exaggerated and it's ostentatious. Um, and his speeches, which uh, was very apt to incline her to laugh. She ran away to indulge the in inclination, leaving the tender and the sublime of pleasure to Harriet's share. So Emma is not unaware of Mr. Elton's foibles, and yet she continues, continues to push Elton on Harriet. And so we begin to see, not begin, we know that, uh, especially in contrast to Knightley and to Martin, who write and speak well, that this guy is just all full of himself. Mr. Elton, um, about this charade, did not intend for it to be made public and seems to feel that its placement in Harriet's book is a violation of the laws of honor. Um, he presumably intended it to be seen only by one person, the lady referred to in the charade. And here we see the game. Um, I frequently see in the criticism the, um, uh, the references to Austin's commitment to the circle of the games, of the word puzzles, of the charades. If we go to chapter 10, um, page 81, um, we see another element of Emma. She had a charitable visit to pay to a poor sick family who lived a little way out of Highbury. Charity, according to um, my note, 
Charity to the poor was one of the most basic duties of the wealthy, particularly wealthy women, who were expected to visit poor families in need of assistance. As the mistress of the wealthiest household in Highbury and someone who is conscientious about her social obligation, Emma would do this regularly. So Austin is trying to create for us the multifaceted nature of Emma. And while she's pushing this marriage inappropriately, she does do some charity work. Um, let's see. Uh, the, the, there you go. Um, the, there go you and your riddle book one of these days, Harriet. Um, oh, let's see. What am I saying? Oh, what a sweet house. Oh. When she barks like that, it scares the daylights out of me. So they are walking to, she and Harriet are walking to do this charitable work, and they pass by the vicarage where Mr. Mr. Elton lives. And Harriet says, oh, what a sweet house, how very beautiful. There are the yellow curtains that Miss Nash admires so much. And Emma says, I do not often walk this way, um, said Emma as they proceeded, but then there will be an inducement and I shall gladly, gradually get immediately acquainted with all the hedges, gates, ponds, um, pollards of the part of Highbury. So she's hinting that this is where she will be coming because Harriet will be living there. Page 82, I wish I could continue contrive it, said she, but I cannot think of any toler tolerable pretense for going in. No servant that I want to inquire about, uh, his housekeeper, no message from my father. She really wants to get in there. Um, but uh, then if we come over to page 82, uh, my being charming, Harriet, is not good enough to induce me to marry. I must find other people charming, one other person at least. And I am, I am not only not going to get married at present, but have very little intention of ever marrying at all. Um, we often see in Austin's, in other books as well, that um, these intelligent women attempt to remain independent. Um, remember that Jane Austen also did not marry. There was one proposal, but that seems to have fallen through. Um, next paragraph. I must see somebody very superior to anyone I have yet, I have seen yet to be tempted. Mr. Elton, you know, not recollecting herself, is out of the question. I do not wish to see any such person. I would rather not be tempted. I cannot really change for the better. If it were to marry, if I were to marry, I must expect to repent it. Dear me, it is so odd to hear a woman talk so. Um, and it's true. That would have been admitting that she's going to remain a spinster. But there's some underlying, underlying um, logic to it because she wants to remain independent. Uh, next paragraph. Fortune I do not want. Employment I do not want. Consequence I do not want. She's set up. Um, I believe few married women are half as much mistress of their husband's house as I am of Hartfield, and never, never could I expect to be so truly beloved and important as she's treated by her father. So always first and always right in man's eye as I am in my father's. Um, Emma's wish to be always right in another person's eye is a significant um, clue to her character. Her words also show her not anticipating what will happen after the death of her father, despite his age and feeble constitution. Isn't that interesting? Um, were he to die while she was still single, she would have plenty of money. Her fortune is later identified as an ample 30,000 pounds, but propriety would dictate that she, at least while young, should not live on her own. This would mean becoming part of someone else's household, most likely her sister's, and thus no longer being the mistress, which would subtract from her independence and power to manage things from her employments and from her social consequence of standing. 
Isn't that interesting? And um, she has not the foresight to know what could happen to her. And I looked it up, and 30,000 pounds is the equivalent, I think it was in 2007, of 3 million pounds, or 3 million, is it 3 million pounds or 3 million dollars? In any case, it's quite a lot of money. Um, so, uh, but then to be an old maid at last, Miss Bates, um, that that is a formidable an image as you can present, Harriet. Harriet, and if I thought I sh should ever be like Miss Bates, so silly, so satisfied, so smiling, so pro prosing, so undistinguishing and unfastidious, and so apt to tell everything relative to everybody about me, I would marry tomorrow. So that's what she sees marriage as foretelling for her. Um, and we, we know, uh, Harriet says, but still, you will be an old maid, and that's so dreadful. Boy, have we seen that echoed in other books. And on page uh, 83, never mind, Harriet, says um, Emma. I shall not be a poor old maid. And it is poverty only which makes celibacy contemptible to a generous public. A single woman with a very narrow income must be a ridiculous or disagreeable old maid. The proper sport of boys and girls, a single woman of good fortune, is always respectable and may be 